Okay, we're at Trek with Dr. Jonathan Crane, uh, and this is um, an avocado tree that has many stages of damage from a laurel wilt. And uh, just a little bit ago, you started to give us some background on laurel wilt and the ambrosia be beetle, and I was hoping that you could just uh, tell everybody what you were talking about then. Sure, thanks, thank you. So a little bit of history on it is um, <clears throat> in 2002, uh, an ambrosia beetle was caught in a trap in outside the port in Port Wentworth, Georgia. And they discovered a new species to the Western hemisphere of ambrosia beetle, Xyloborus glabratus. And over a period of time, they found that there was an association between this beetle and trees in the Lauraceae, or the laurel family, such as red bays, dying in the area. Uh, and then they put the two and two together, and so it turns out that this ambrosia beetle um, carries a fungus, and it carries a fungus for its own benefit, a symbiotic fungus, which it farms and eats, but it turns out that that fungus is also pathogenic to trees in the laurel family, including avocado. Uh, long story short, it started moving through uh, the red bay trees up in, the, up in, uh, jo up in um, Georgia um, and expanding its territory and it takes over about 20, 30 miles a year in new territory, killing the red bay trees up in that area. It also attacks other species in the laurel family as well, other native species. So it's moving through the natural areas uh, on these native species eventually made its way down to South Florida um, and in 2012 was, uh, actually in 2010 the beetle was discovered about 30 miles north of here. Uh, in, in 2011 the first native tree was documented to be dead from the pathogen, a native tree about 25 miles or so from here. And in 2012, the first avocado tree in February of 2012, the first commercial avocado tree was killed in Dade County. Since that time, 2012, we've lost about a quarter of a million avocado, commercial avocado trees. And we've lost probably 2,500 acres, maybe a little bit more of avocado trees commercially. Um, the beetle uh, and the pathogen uh, that it carries is originally from parts of subtropical temperate zone Asia. Um, in the native habitat there in the forests. The species of trees that it attacks include trees in the, the Dipteraceae, the Fabiaceae, and the Lauraceae. However, the trees co-evolved with this beetle and the pathogen over probably millions of years. And those trees don't decline or die from this pathogen, from the symbiont of this beetle. Um, but when it came to the New World, uh, the New World trees in the Laurel family have never seen this fungus before um, and tend to overreact to the presence of the fungus. And what they try to do is when the fungus gets in the tree, they try to wall it off, the tree does, and it produces tyloses, which is a structure the tree produces to try to wall the, the fungus off, but also gums and resins. However, two things. One is, once the tree starts doing that, the fungus actually moves to a new location in the tree. It then attempts to wall it off there. It then, by that time, is also moved to another part of the tree. It just keeps doing that. So it's a cascading effect. Eventually, the tree walls off so much of itself, the tree self-destructs. Um, so it, it sort of, uh, it turns on this self-defense system and can't turn it off and ends up uh, killing itself, basically. We've just walked through a whole bunch of what looks like dead trees, right. and we're walking on chipped up dead tree. <laughs> uh, and so this is the area of track that, you, well, one of the areas where you're doing experiments with the laurel wilt. Yes. 
Uh, so how's it going? Yeah, so this is a trial to look at a different application uh, method for a fungicide that's registered for use in laurel wilt control, in the pathogen control. Currently, it's an injected product called propiconazole, but we would like to see if we could use it as a drench, which is cheaper to do, faster to do. So what we did was we uh, tagged the trees with different treatments, uh, different, three different levels of the propiconazole as a soil drench, um, and then we have a control, several controls, um, and we first treated the trees with a root rot fungicide to make sure the roots were healthy. And that and waited about three, four, five months. Then came back, treated the trees with propiconazole, uh, and waited again about three or four months to make sure uh, the propiconazole got up in the trees. And we actually tested the trees to document yes, there is <laughs> propiconazole in the tree yeah. and the level that it is. And then the idea was then to come in and inoculate the trees with the pathogen, the, the uh, the lower wilt pathogen. And the hope was that two of the big problems we have is that you'll get one side of the tree hit with the pathogen, right? The ambrosia beetles attack the tree, inoculate the tree with the pathogen, and it moves from this limb or this side of the tree to this side. So we wanted to see is if we can get enough propiconazole in the tree by a soil drench, can we prevent the pathogen from moving here to move into the other side of the tree? The other thing we wanted to test was as you know, avocado trees root graft together underground. So the adjacent trees are root grafted. And one of the big problems we have is one tree will come down with laurel wilt and then it moves to its neighbor, killing the next tree and the next tree because they're root grafted. So the other idea was that can we prevent it from moving from one tree that gets infected to the next tree? And the hope is that there's enough propiconazole in the root system to prevent that transmission of the pathogen to the adjacent tree. So that's where we are right now with this. We came in, inoculated the limbs, um, and, and um, tried to see, you know, did it move to the other limb? In almost all cases, it moved to the other limb. <laughs> so what we did first is one limb came down with a disease. The, the, the limb that we inoculated came down with a disease. So we cut that limb off in the hopes there was enough propaganda on the rest of the tree to prevent it from moving into the rest. However, as you can see, it did move into the other limbs. So now what we did was we said, okay, we're gonna cut this off and we're gonna see, will the tree re-sprout and will that tree re-sprout and live? And that's what we're testing now. The other thing we're testing in this first row, uh, we had come in and trenched all these trees so they were separated except for some of these. And so what we're testing now is, if that tree has laurel wilt, is it gonna move to its neighbor uh, if it has propiconazole? And that's what we're doing right now. And we're right in the middle of it. So, uh, you know, of course the root system you know, from these trees goes out far, like yeah. six <laughs> times the, the distance of the, or the, from the trunk to the canopy or yes. whatever. Yes. And so uh, you were able to, do this experiment because of a lot of trenching and yes. so you said yeah. was there like a delay between uh when you trenched to when you yes. uh actually yes. yeah about uh, six months maybe maybe eight months between that time first thing we did was come in trench all the rows and then trench between the trees to separate all the trees mm -hmm. down into our rock <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is like four inches down <laughs> yeah four inches down um to separate all the trees. Mm -hmm. um, and then came in, you know, pushed the soil back in, and then came, treated the trees for, to prevent, in case, yeah, treated the trees for Phytophthora root rot, which is a fungus that attacks the roots. We wanted to make sure, hey, we have a healthy root system. We did that, waited a number of months, then went ahead, treated the trees with the propiconazole, waited to see, and then verified, yes, the fungicide is up into the limbs, it's up in the tree uh, at a useful concentration, then came in, inoculated this limb to see if it would prevent it from moving to this limb, mm -hmm. did not seem to work. And now we're seeing, okay, but is there enough in the rest of the tree to allow this tree to sprout and, and quote unquote recover, mm -hmm. right? And then that's one part. And the other part is, can, can us treating this tree uh, 
and have one tree that's infested and the adjacent tree that's not, can we prevent it from moving from the root system to its neighbor? And that's where we are right now. Yeah, it's a huge problem. Huge it's uh, yeah. So a lot of a lot of avocado uh, growers. Uh, uh, like how many acres of yes. avocados in? Florida? So we started out before this showed up in 2012. We had about 7,500 acres. We probably have somewhere between 4,500 and 5,000 acres. We we've lost at least a quarter of a million trees. Um, yeah, uh, Florida grows a fair amount of avocados, but like nothing compared to California right. and, of course, Mexico. Right. Uh, so it's it's a problem that's much bigger than Florida. Yes, and you're exactly right, Chris, because this this uh, beetle, the beetles that carry the pathogen, attack trees in the laurel family, in the natural areas. So, for instance, in Florida and the southeastern U.S., swamp bay and red bay trees are attacked, and the beetles take over about. 30 new miles of territory each year. Wow. Yes. And they have been moving there. So far, the, the, the pathogen and the disease is as far north as, as North Carolina as, and as far west as Texas and as far in the Midwest, I think it's up to Tennessee, places like that, in the natural areas. Mm -hmm. So we know it's sort of moving through these natural areas where there's native trees in the Laurasee. Um, and I mean, we have proposed that, you know, eventually it's going to reach California and, and Mexico and we're not, you know, hoping for that in any shape yeah, or form, but just... we're concerned that because it moves through the natural areas that that's, a, that's certainly a potential. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I hope you have a lot of uh, success with this project. I know it's been going on for years, so just yeah. hope that there's a, a good treatment for that. I hope so. there's a lot of avocado lovers out I there. Know, I know, <laughs> I know. And you know, we're not just looking at chemical treatments, we're also looking at biological control of both the pathogen and of the ambrosia beetles as well. Yeah, I guess the only good news um, for some people in South Florida is that it doesn't really occur um, if you have just one tree. So if you have, uh, you know, like, a home and you've planted an avocado tree, you're probably gonna be okay. Yes. Yeah. So. In general, yes. I have seen it in some dooryards, but uh, in general, yeah, your isolated trees um, are probably safer than a grove like this. Um, yeah, and we have a, a you know we have a really good team that's working on this. Uh, uh, our plant pathologist, Dr. Gazis, our entomologist, Dr. Cadillo, Dr. Schaefer's our plant physiologist, our economist is uh, Dr. Blair. Um, all really good people yeah. and, and people in Gainesville. We have some molecular biologists uh, in Gainesville and plant pathologists, um, Dr. Rollins and others that are working on, the, on this problem as well. So uh, one other quick question sure. I was just thinking about, is there a particular part of the tree that the beetles normally go into? I mean, is there like something that's extra attractive, uh, like uh, through the wood? I, yes. uh, but is it, it does it have to be a certain diameter of a, uh, of a branch or right. something? Right, really good question. Um, I can tell you the original beetle that brought the disease with it, the, the symbiont and the disease with it, is attracted to large diameter wood like trunks. Mm -hmm. In fact, part of its, its uh, orientation is, uh, one, is, is chemo, so it smells volatiles coming off the trees, and then when it gets close, it's focusing in on a silhouette, and the wider the silhouette, the more attractive it is. So if you have a bunch of young avocado trees, you're also probably be okay. pretty safe? Yes. The other beetles, and there's more than one beetle now that, that oh, transmit good. the disease. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's about five now, even though there's about 10 or 11 species that are contaminated, we know of at least three or four that, that transmit the disease. Uh -huh. These other beetles are not so much oriented on the, just the diameter of the tree. Uh -huh. um, they're, well, we've had ambrosia beetles down here forever. There's over 20 species. And you know, you used to walk through groves and you'd see a little bread, dead branch up here, and a little dead branch there, no big deal. Um, but now with this pathogen, what will happen is a beetle will go up and, and attack a tree. And it may be, uh, very commonly, it's the major limbs. Mm -hmm. That's really common is, is the major limbs. And so then the tree begins to stress out. And a stress signal that trees produce, whether it's drought stress, flooding stress, 
um, freezing stress or ambrosia beetle, you know, plant, path uh, plant pathogen stress is to produce ethylene. And it turns out ethylene is a universal, <laughs> extra I'm not ethylene, uh, ethanol, yeah, ethanol. ethanol. Yeah. And it turns out that ethanol is sort of a universal attractant for ambrosia beetles. Mm. So here you had one beetle attack the tree, the tree gets a little woozy and starts producing ethanol, and now- It's got a party. It has a party, it has yeah. hundreds attack the tree. Yeah. And not every beetle, not these other species, the original beetle always had, I would say, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time has the pathogen with it. These other beetles have other fungi as well. So not every single one of them is contaminated with the pathogen, but enough of them are, obviously, that it causes a problem. Yeah, there are a lot of bugs. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for the thanks. update, uh, sure. and yeah, as I say, I hope that you get some uh, really good uh, success so. here. I hope so. Soon. Yeah. I hope so. Thanks.